Hey everyone, I'm Richard, I run Digital Foundry, and I'm joined here by my colleague, Mr. Tom Morgan. Hi there. And so, this, well you obviously can't fail to notice it, it is the PlayStation 4 Pro, it has finally arrived in the office, and uh, yeah, we've got one of these bizarre staggered embargo situations where, for today, we are allowed to show what is inside the box. We can do an unboxing video and uh, yeah, 26 years of game journalism, Tom. First time I've ever done one of these. Uh, you love them, don't you? Uh, I think they're <laughs> sort of generally quite inane sort of exercises. Uh, spoilers so, here, I, yeah. I strongly suspect inside we will find a console, a controller, possibly a power cable. HDMI. Well, I'm excited for the power cable. I mean, <laughs> we don't have enough kettle leads. <laughs> Good point, yeah. So, yeah, um, but on the, on the flip side, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was flown out to uh, San Mateo, California, and I met with Mark Cerny, uh, system architect of PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 4 Pro. Got a big bunch of details there, so I'm hoping I can inject some element of interest into this video uh, beyond showing you a black box. So, Tom, would you like to do the honours? Sure. You've already had a go at this already, <laughs> I, I so... Have, I, have, uh, uh, I have to admit that uh, I did indeed uh, open up the box to have a look what's inside. Right. And uh, also to uh, address a controversy, there was uh, some Twitter murmurings that um, HDCP 2.2 was permanently enabled on the Pro. Oh uh, yeah, be careful with that, there we go. Um, yeah, I did hear some uh, uh, murmurings on Twitter that HDCP 2.2 was permanently enabled on the Pro, which would stop anyone streaming or capturing, and uh, I wanted to check that out, it's not true. So yeah, just turn off HDCP as per normal, you're good to go if you've got the right kit, of course. So, okay, where are we here? Um, Take out the tray at the top. Well, there's something at the tray, come on, let's be uh, thorough about this. <laughs> Goodness grief. All right, there's instructions. Instructions. Brilliant. Let me have a look. Um, yeah, instructions. It's white paper with absolutely no real interesting information. And a quick start guide, which is just basically uh, all of the stuff you get in there and what you can do with the machine. Brilliant. OK, let's uh, continue. OK, so there's a side thing here. Right. The most exciting part, there's the other. Uh, it's the, uh, the power cable, right. It's the full sort of PS3 style kettle lead. So, so we... far my predictions about the contents of the box have been panning out 100%. Right, yeah. good. Well, you've got your USB cable, the new micro type. Okie doke. Uh, a lovely new control. That'll be the new uh, sort of revision of it. Yeah, this will be the new uh, DualShock, which uh, you can actually control directly via USB without Bluetooth. It also has a kind of uh, strip light here which shows the RGB lighting from sort of this position. Uh, but nothing new there, that was in the uh, PS4 Slim. A uh, tiny HDMI cable if you need <laughs> it at this point. Um, well, funnily enough, um, a lot of your older HDMI cables might have issues at 4K. Uh, worth bearing in mind there, the lower Not all HDMIs ones. are born alike, are they? Um, yeah, I, I think if you've got an older cable and it's quite short, you're probably mm. going to be okay. But um, HDMI 2.0 doubles bandwidth over 1.4. And uh, yeah, you may have issues with HDMI connectivity if you use an older cable. Uh, I know John was having issues with that. Right. But come on, the main event. Right. What's going on? What have we got? Okay, let's get with it. So that's it. That's the, that's the, yeah, okay. And this is... Okay. There's a bit of, there's a bit of leafleting bump there in there as well. It's, so uh, please uh, read all that aloud before we... <laughs> um, it's nothing particularly special. It's just Sony rather cunningly uh, putting an advert for their uh, 4K HDR screens uh, inside the packaging, which is a good move, but... Uh, well, is it a buy a, a ZD9 or something like um, that? Well, if you've got like $4,000, I would recommend it. But um, this seems to be just a standard Bravia XD93. I'm uh, not really too sure what that one's about, but um, generally speaking, uh, we've got a Panasonic here, which does the job in a sort of mid-range price bracket. And uh, we're also looking into the Samsung models, uh, which we'll report back on soon. But you actually have the console here. Let's uh, clear the table here. And... Right. What, first impressions? 
It's got a good bit of weight to it, actually. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, they they slimmed it down, and now they now they've bulked it right back up again. Yeah, and it's got a kind of uh, mirrored PlayStation logo on there. Yeah, it's quite nice, actually. And it's uh, it is indeed the triple stack, the Chad Warden triple, triple decker. <laughs> right, do they have the PlayStation buttons? They, they have the PlayStation symbols yeah. as feet as per the slim. And, uh, well, if we look at the front, actually some things I noticed earlier uh, when I uh, unboxed it in secret um, is that, yes, we have real buttons. Uh, I really hate capacitive right, buttons. Right, so Microsoft and Sony went through this sort of phase of just, all oh, right, everything's got to be capacitive yeah, let's, now. Let's, let's, have just a, do it. let's have a button that you can turn off your console just by brushing up slightly against cable. it. cable. Yeah, it was just absolutely insane. The number of face-offs that have been ruined by just the cable glancing it, I can it's tell It's annoying. You. Um, it yeah, is. so yeah, physical buttons there, which I really like. Um, there's the, the BD drive there, obviously not an HDR. All matte finish. Drive, all matte finish, like the C chassis and the slim. Uh, looking at the rear here, uh, they've moved back to the kettle uh, cable arrangement from the PS3, the fat PS3. Right. Uh, HDMI 2.0, the camera port, Toslink, uh, which was missing from the slim. Yes, I missed that actually. And uh, a revelation in Sony design, everyone, uh, the rear USB port, which uh, should make your PlayStation VR arrangement slightly more attractive. Yeah, uh, I don't and, think it'll do much to it. It's already a, a mess of cables, but... Yeah, and finally, uh, that we've got the Ethernet port here, and uh, yeah, we've got a kind of protective... They don't usually do this. Uh, does that mean it's extra easy to access? I, I don't suppose we've looked into that, but... Into what? Is, is that the HDD uh, This is the Yeah, point? it is the HDD access point, and it is uh, kind of similar in style to the... Uh, to the slim. I don't know okay. if we can actually remove move that. It seems to be a there is a holding screw there. Right. Have a quick look at it. that. Word is out that there's a SATA three uh, connection inside there. Yeah, a lot of people have been kind of. Uh, the, the excitement's there, but uh, I think there's also there might be a bandwidth issue elsewhere. Just well, in terms here's of the, the thing. internal circuitry. Whenever we've done an SSD test, uh, the actual sort of copying. Mm. Bandwidth has also always been really low, you know, like 20 megabytes a second, something yeah. like that, even with an SSD. The only gain you get from an SSD is a uh, instant seek time for finding the new files. So in terms of SATA 3, uh, well, if SATA 2 is being incredibly hobbled like that, you know, 20 megabytes a second thereabouts, uh, then well, I would expect that uh, the SATA 3 will be hobbled as well. So, you know, we'll do some tests on it, of course, but uh, I wouldn't get your hopes up there. Let's clear the table a bit here and bring out the older PS4s. Let's start with the original model. So it is fairly, it is a fair bit bigger, isn't it? Uh, there's, you know, a few mils here and there on the length and the breadth. So it is actually quite larger. Now let's add the, the slim. So it's interesting to note that the, the, the slim actually has pretty much the same design language as the PS4 Pro. It's just kind of like a, a double-decker, <laughs> a mm. mini, as it were. And it's probably one of the reasons why Sony weren't so happy about the Slim being revealed early. The whole design language for the entire PlayStation 4 line going into this holiday season was revealed. So size comparison, well, it's still definitely a console, isn't it? Uh, yeah, that was the worry, that it'd just be a PC miniaturized. Uh, but actually, it's uh, it's a fairly, you know, I can, I can grab it with one hand and it's, it's kind of still sort of more... It reminds me of the uh, original PS3, the sort of weight of that, and the fact that right. you almost felt like you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't feel comfortable taking it to a mate's house almost, because it's, a, uh, it's a, yeah. bit, a bit too much. It's veering towards PC. Uh, Possibly, yeah. It's not I like think, the GameCube. I think so, it would be, but, you know, I think it's a, a console box, uh, definitely is, you know, it's... it's, it's pretty decent, I think, overall. I think uh, the main issue for me is going to be the fan noise and the power consumption right. and the heat, obviously, uh, because obviously it's uh, a much more capable console. And it kind of leads into uh, one of the discussions I had with Mark Cerny, actually, which was uh, how they've actually implemented the larger GPU and back compat. So the way it was explained to me was that the uh, new GPU is kind of like simple doubling of the old one. So here's the old GPU, and then it's kind of like a mirror image, the new GPU. Mm -hmm. And then the way that back compat works is very simple. They just turn off the new GPU, half the compute units turned off, 
clock frequency drops from 911 megahertz down to 800 in part on, online with the original PlayStation 4. And that's it, that's, that, that's the way they did it. It raises an interesting question though, because if it is just like a butterfly spread in a, in a symmetrical way, both sides still have higher higher clock than the original model. Well, they, so if they they're only using it. one half, uh, then it's uh, potentially you can get better results with your existing if, games. If, if they have um, upclocked it, and Mark certainly said they haven't. Okay. I did actually case. ask them if they'd even tested with the higher clocks, and apparently not. So. Well, then again, you know, there's a sort of residual effect of uh, tinkering with the hardware. We saw it with Xbox One S, even though there was a slight overclock there. And, I'm sure there will be a difference. Well, we can try it, but I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure there won't be because they were really adamant about this. And uh, it kind of highlights actually what I've seen to be a fundamental difference in approach between Sony and Microsoft. Okay, so Microsoft, from what I've kind of gathered, the approach there is that, you know, basically Xbox is now a platform. So you can run your Xbox 360 games, you can run your Xbox One games, you can run your Scorpio games. It's kind of like a single unified platform. And I see that stretching into the future. Now, fundamentally that limits them, I think, to AMD parts, unless they're really clever. The beginning of Mark Cerny's presentation was all about console generations. So he started on PS1, PS2, PS3, and how it was a reset button pressed at each point. And he was saying there's no reset button with PlayStation 4, and he laid, uh, with the PlayStation 4 Pro rather, he laid out a whole series of criteria uh, of what constitutes a console generation. And one of those key criteria is CPU. Now obviously the CPU in the Pro is of a slightly faster version, 30%, 31% faster than the base PlayStation 4. So, you know, that isn't a generational console leap. So there's been a kind of theory that you know going forward consoles are going to be like mobile phones where you know it is just iterative improvements from one generation to the next and microsoft i've kind of got the idea that they might follow a similar path to that obviously not yearly but perhaps when new process shrinks come along but sony they were pretty clear to me you know mark sony was really clear that they think that the console generation leap is really important. They think that it's um, they think it's healthy, and you know all of these criteria for what constitutes a reset is you know faster GPU, faster CPU, uh, explosion in memory capacity, storage as well. I think they were, he was talking about that. None of the new machines, whether it's Scorpio or Pro here, they actually qualify for what Sony would say is a generational leap. So I think that PlayStation Five. Uh, may well be backwards compatible, uh, compatible with 4, but on the other hand, they've left the door open for them to choose any architecture they want, and they can leave uh, PlayStation 4 behind. This is not a new generation. That was the point they were making. Mm. And the timing is pretty apt as well, because it's uh, th three years on from the original release, but it's, uh, it feels like it's a mid-generational uh, yeah. position in well, terms of the timing. They basically said that it is, you know, for the discerning gamer, but primarily it's for the gamer that's got a 4K screen. Right. And, you know, the games are going to be the same, basically, you know. The, in terms of the absolute basics of gameplay, you know, Tomb Raider on, on, on PS4 and Tomb Raider on Pro, yeah. the experience is interchangeable in terms of what you're actually doing in the game, the concept of the game. It's just the Pro will have those options for better graphics or 4K uh, right. or higher frame rates. Yeah, well, one of the things I'm mainly interested in with this one is uh, just seeing what it can do at 1080p still, because there's a, I'm sure, yeah, a whole I saw that. bunch of gamers out there who are not invested in a 4K set yet or a bit tentative. Yeah, I actually saw that. Um, and uh, I'm sure, you know, we'll be looking into it, certainly with 1080p mode, as we call it, selected. Uh, to see exactly what the benefits are. And, and I've seen the benefits because I had the demos. You did. <laughs> um, yeah, basically, uh, Rise of the Tomb Raid, uh, uh, John actually had a really good point um, in his analysis, which is that the anti-aliasing is terrible on that game, especially on foliage, horrible shimmer, and uh, it was kind of like one of the worst visual elements that, uh, in the game. I actually saw the 4K version super sampled, and all of that shimmer is just gone. And uh, amusingly, I also saw Knack. And that's uh, with super sampling, sorry. 
Yeah, that's super sampling. Yep. Yeah, I believe so. Anyway, we'll obviously, that would we'll make sense if they can get rid of everything. Nat yeah, as well, it though. just looks much, much, much cleaner, and it is something that is desirable and work having, uh, worth having. And Nac, yeah, Nac was the same thing. So uh, it's kind of like quite a, a simple visual style in Nac. Right. This was the game that kind of debuted the original console, and yeah, yeah that three was years a, that ago, was a Mark Cerny produced. It was a Cerny game, so it makes sense that it uh, positioned yeah. that up front. Yeah, and you know, that will again, it is just super sampling. Um, and what we saw there was. Uh, it's got kind of very simple visuals and there's a lot of sort of moire patterns yeah. um, on sort of oblique angles, stuff like that. All of that completely vanished on the Pro version. Did you notice frame rate issues on that one? Uh, I didn't really play it. It was literally just side-by-side -side, uh, image quality comparisons. Because I grew, the main thing I remember from that was the yeah, wavering the, frame rate. It had a very and wobbly frame rate. Because so it was all physics-based stuff. And that's, I guess we'll see there. But the thing about Knack was that Knack himself is made up of really complex, uh, small geometry. You know, lots of little bits and pieces. And you could see some pretty bad shimmer on edges and around the character there. That was crystal clear at 1080p with super sampling. So that was... You know, I'm not advocating replaying that because it's got fantastically better visuals, but it's an improvement. Uh, and uh, hopefully at some point it will actually come up on PlayStation Plus. Uh, Shadow of Mordor. Now this is interesting because, yeah. um, again, 1080p, that is super sampling. Uh, 4K, it isn't actually using checkerboarding. It's just got a dynamic resolution uh, from uh, standard, you know, standard upscaling techniques. But uh, the point there is, um, well, I didn't actually see it at 4K, funny enough, but uh, at 1080p, where I did see it, again, it was a side-by-side -side comparison. Really, really crisp visuals. And uh, it looked all right, actually. It looked pretty good. And the frame rate didn't seem unduly compromised, so... It was a 30 FPS experience. It was a 30 FPS the, uh, game, yeah, original, definitely. So yeah. Mm -hmm. That's fair enough, though. Yeah, As and... that path, of course, I think, a lot of people might be going into this expecting uh, 60 FPS upgrades, but I think, I think we're, mostly yeah, the, we're getting the, 30 FPS again, but with better visuals. The, uh, I think the boat has sort of sailed on that one. Yeah. I think people kind of realise now that, you know, it's not going to happen. That's actually a really interesting question, what PlayStation 4 Pro does for 10 1080p and uh, there will be games where you just get more 1080p goodness. Paragon is another one. Super sampling, a lot of people aren't really impressed with that. I'd say reserve judgment until you've seen it because uh, Tomb Raider looked really, really clean. Even that showed uh, a big, big improvement there. Uh, but mostly it is all about 4K. Uh, which we'll be testing in due course. And of course, John and myself went to see Infinite Warfare, which was yeah. running, uh, I think it was a sort of checkerboarding uh, on that, but it still looked, you know, it made yeah. good use of the 4K sets we were in front of, and we were very much about this distance from it. Okay. Uh, and it was appreciable there, so. Yeah, so we had yeah. actually spoke to Mark Cerny about different uh, techniques they're using. Uh, so Deus Ex, and there's been one shot released of that, and when we looked at it, it looked like a standard upscale. Um, it was like a 7 over 8 pixel ratio in both directions. Yeah. Was it 3200? Uh, uh, 3340, I haven't got the figure yeah. in front of me, but it is kind of like slightly higher than 1800p, which kind of struck me as odd. But it looks like a standard upscale, but what's actually happening there is that it is ch checkerboarding up to a dynamic resolution and then it's being upscaled to 4K. So that shot that we actually had, because it's static, checkerboarding just looks pretty much flawless uh, when it's static. So it was actually just hitting its top dynamic resolution limit there. Yeah. Infinite Warfare is indeed checkerboarding up to a 4K frame buffer, so there's yeah, no... It looked good as well, because uh, you know, as you say, when it's static, and when John and I were just looking at it without any movement, at, it resolved at 4K perfectly and then you're like shifting it about and you could uh, very occasionally I don't know if there's um, exactly what causes it but it wasn't always there just a very s s faint artifact occasionally when you're moving uh, well it's all it based was. checkerboarding is all based from uh, spatial and temporal anti-aliasing and they've got actually got custom hardware in there that, that sort of helps out with that so they've got this thing called the ID buffer now the thing about temporal anti-aliasing it's all about taking information from prior frames and then figuring out where it sits in the current frame owing to movement. And this ID buffer basically gives them an invaluable tool in figuring out what objects are where and where they were before. They can track objects, they can track individual triangles, uh, where they were in the last frame, where they are now, and then they can use that to reconstruct 
a much higher resolution image and the as you as you say the, the effects have been pretty good now they're not perfect but you know a few things here that really do help out the technique first of all uh, is the fact that uh, well 4k screens in motion they actually resolve much lower resolutions so you know three actually something as low as 300 to 350 lines you know this is kind of like why you get this lcd ghosting effect a kind of smearing effect mm. so this really helps the checkerboarding because you know in motion which is where the uh, temporal anti-aliasing is kind of at its most taxed then you know they can afford to be a bit sort of loose with image quality there because the screen ultimately isn't going to resolve it now our capture tools will which is going to be kind of interesting yes and uh, secondly there's just the fact that 4k screens are so dense in terms of pixels so you know minor uh, artifacting is really difficult to pick up from as you say even when you're like you know this far away from a four, you know this is a 58 inch screen mm. it's really difficult to pick up on so you know uh, I think what are people calling it faux k some k okay, yeah yeah <laughs> but it yeah. replaces 1080p r <laughs> yeah but the point is that it works it looks it looks really good for the most part and um I think Deus Ex, was, which uses checkerboarding and dynamic resolution scaling and sharpening, was the only one, the only title I saw where it kind of didn't really work for me. But you know, maybe the final game would be so different. So, when you visited uh, Mark Cerny, he had a test for you, didn't he? Uh, he put a laid yeah, out the before and after images, a true 4K image yeah. versus this uh, was a sort of up checkerboarded. 4K. This was Days Gone, which is the Sony Bend Studios game, which is easily one of the most impressive 4k titles that i've seen on any platform it just looks incredible and um yeah essentially they had two screens they had the checkerboarding uh screen and the native resolution screen it was it was a difficult test because it was absolutely static image and this is where in theory checkerboarding should be pretty much flawless but you did notice i did actually notice yeah. the difference but it, it really required a bit of effort it required uh, looking at uh, specific textures uh, where there was a very slight blur. If you look at some of the media that Sony has released, like Horizon Zero Dawn, I think uh, we actually published some infamous and Days Gone screenshots on Eurogamer. It actually does look uh, a tiny little bit blurred. And again, you know, in real life conditions, when you're not centimeters away from the screen, you know, it just looks flawless and I really did actually have a bit of an effort trying to, to to find the difference there. They actually have another upscaling technique which I saw in an infamous demo which is called geometry uh, upscaling, geometry 4k, where um, the ID buffer and the depth, depth buffer uh, are actually resolved at 2160p uh, and uh, the actual rendering is still like sort of native 1080p but they can use the information from the, the, the depth buffer and the ID buffer to reconstitute 4K geometry so the edges are absolutely perfect, uh, static at least, maybe even in motion and it has a very low computational cost. And uh, this is a route to native 4K that isn't really that taxing on system resources. And also uh, developer uh, resource time as well, because in the end... Yeah, it's... the geometry buffer, uh, Mark Cerny said they can do that in like two days. The checkerboarding about three yes. weeks. So it's meant to be very hands-off. You, you just kind of enable... And Ch checkerboarding takes... requires some time, um, okay. but the geometry thing, uh, possibly not. But the point about the geometry thing is that all of your pixel shaders, all of the actual computation is still done at 1080p. It's just the geometry that's at 4K. So in terms of like anti-aliasing, in, in terms of edges, that sort of thing, it, it's great. But in terms of an actual native 4K display presentation, something off about it when you see it, it doesn't look right. And then when on the infamous demo, when they shifted to checkerboarding, when they shifted to native 4K, they actually had a native 4K demo. It might have been days gone actually. But the, the point is that um, there is a revelatory increase going from geometry uh, 4K to checkerboard 4K, simply because the pixel shaders are actually uh, working with a much higher pixel count at that point. So, so yeah. Were there any other tidbits Cerny gave? Yeah. Um, PlayStation VR support, uh, they have um, some interesting stuff there. Uh, Multi-resolution shading. 
So yeah, we've got this cutaway here to some battle zone footage running on PlayStation VR. And you can see this is actually what the console is outputting to uh, the headset, which is very, very different to what you actually see on the social screen. Mm. And you can kind of see it's a sort of um, uh, a weird distortion effect, which is designed to match the lenses in the PSVR. But you'll also note that there's a lot of black space on the edges there. And uh, what's happening there is that obviously a native 1080p image is being distorted into stereo, 960 by 1080 per eye, but there's still a lot of black space there. But that is post distortion filter. Before the distortion filter, you're generating all of this extra resolution that in the final resolve, you're not actually really seeing. So the point with multi-resolution shading is that you can uh, essentially render out into uh, different sectors of resolution. So center the screen, highest resolution possible. And then as you go further out, uh, it actually lowers. And it's kind of like a, a grid. It's like 25 segments in all. And the further out you go, the lower resolution you go. So this could be actually pretty big for uh, the uh, PS4 Pro. Uh, Mark Sony was saying second generation PSVR titles could really make good use of it. Um, but yeah, the point is that obviously the Pro has got much more rendering power than the base PS4. But with this, you get even more uh, from, you know, even more from your GPU budget. So yeah, Pro is going to be big for PSVR, but there are issues with the breakout box only supporting HDMI 1.4. Yeah, it's a bit of a nuisance. I mean, you can do a, you can get a pass through. Yeah, you, but... but you can't use the full RGB 4K and you can't use HDR. And uh, John was actually talking about banding issues that he saw. Yeah, 8-bit uh, color, uh, something yeah, like that. Yeah, something like that. It can, yeah. only, it can only process 8-bit uh, color and it's obviously got Chroma subsampling on it. It's Could a bit of a issue. mismatch between the two projects, the Pro and the VR. It's a well, bit of a shame to see, really, because you, you want everything to be set up. I you don't want to tinker with the cable set up. Or I understand that they there. wanted to get the Pro down to a budget, but, you know, in theory, you'd kind of want the external processor box to be integrated directly into the console as opposed to yeah. keeping the you know, the rat's nest of cables that we've got. With the I car. think that was a necessary concession to get the social screen up, though, uh, just to have the... Well, you could have the a social out. screen on this. But, I um, but I think the, you know, I think the point is that everything about the Pro is designed to kind of never make the mistake that they did with the PlayStation 3, which was $599 box uh, at launch. So, yeah, I mean, um, no 4K uh, UHD Blu-ray drive, uh, in this, that that was a cost-cutting measure. It must have been. Yeah, you're going to be stuck with like streaming media on that, um, which might be the future. To be fair, but uh, it's yeah. a, a lot of people were disgruntled about that, and I, I'm kind of I was with them as well. To begin with, because um, if I'm just buying a 4K TV, you kind of want an all-in-one box that does everything. Yeah, you at least want to see it, but, just to, uh, to know, sample it. Another thing you picked up on was the. Uh, uh, the front end, the PS4 front end on this, this will be 4K, is that right? Well, um, here's the thing, uh, the PS4 uh, Pro actually has uh, an extra gigabyte of slow DDR3 memory. Uh, is it a gigabyte or half? It's a gigabyte. <laughs> so the PlayStation 4 Pro does have an extra one gigabyte of DDR3 memory, slow memory, that sits on the motherboard. It replaces a 256 megabyte module that was on the original PlayStation 4. Now, um, what happens is that non-mission critical sort of apps that stay in memory alongside games get swapped out to the slower memory. So for example, Netflix, you can swap between Netflix and a game yeah. on PlayStation 4. And uh, it's kind of a bit of a waste of really fast memory. So what they do now is swap it out to this slower partition. And uh, developers get an extra 512 megs for the frame buffers required for 4K. And also the new menu system, uh, apparently it is native 4K. And uh, this is what the rest of the memory is used for there. So yeah, interesting That makes stuff, sense, but... you know. Yeah, there's a bit more uh, obviously about the uh, ins and outs technically of the PlayStation 4 Pro that I spoke with Mark Cerny about. Uh, please do uh, check out the link in the video description below where everything is written up. Uh, there's a few more sort of uh, interesting uh, tidbits that I'll release over time on that. Uh, nothing sort of hugely consequential. The VR uh, really and the, the kind of 4K upscaling techniques that they use, that really was the key points of the presentation. But I think we're going to leave it here for now because we've got a lot of work to do. 
Yeah, a lot of face-offs to produce, lots of comparisons. A lot of 4K Let's Plays. Yeah, that and, too. And um, yeah, so we're going to be getting on with that. Uh, full review of this will be in the next few days, November the 7th, I believe the embargo uh, lifts on that. So look forward to that. Any questions you've got about the PlayStation 4 Pro, put them in the comments. Uh, going to be working pretty hard on that, but if I can sneak in uh, any extra data that you guys want, please do let me know. But that's all I've got for you for now. So yeah, thanks Tom for joining me for this one. Norris. No and uh, yeah, I think we did actually succeed in turning an unboxing video into something vaguely interesting. Well, I hope so. Yay <laughs> us. Okay, well, thanks for watching. Please do like, subscribe, all of that, and I'll catch you next time.